Before I start, there are thousands of angles and arguments to be made on the subject of God and atheism. People have spent thousands of hours debating this issue, uh, and the following is my humble attempt at making a case for atheism. First of all, why would I want to talk about atheism and the existence of God, or rather the non-existence of God? Recent events have led me to come back to and reflect on my beliefs as an atheist, which I might or might not get into, but it is also one of the most interesting conversations I can think of. It makes us think of the greatest questions and mysteries we are capable of asking. The universe within itself is a mystery, a beautiful mystery. The biggest question can probably be boiled down to this one. Why is there something rather than nothing? Now, in many ways, the question why is a silly one. Lawrence Krauss, Richard Dawkins and others would argue that the why question is somewhat meaningless. And what we actually mean is how is there something rather than nothing? The how is a far more meaningful and accurate question. It's difficult for us to grasp the idea that there might not be a why. Um, it's, it's tough because, because it is in our human nature to seek why answers, even if they are irrelevant. The simplest answer from the empirical scientific standpoint is that we simply don't know how there is something rather than nothing. The question might be answered within our lifetime as physicists are getting closer to that answer. Uh, there's been many how questions that we've been uh, that we have answered that was previously occupied by God. But as we learn more about the universe, the nature of reality, biology, evolution, and so on, the less space there is for the answer, God. The theistic answer to the why who uh, why how question would be something along the lines of because it is God's will that there is something rather than nothing. Once you say that it that it is God's will, then, you know, we can start asking, but why? We need to establish the greatest problem facing the argument against God, which is that the idea of God is unfalsifiable. It is also unprovable. There's simply no objective pr proof for God's existence. And our existence alone is not sufficient proof of God. Uh, you know, the eyeball um, nature, it's not sufficient proof for God. The holy text is also a very bad and disappointing argument for God. Throughout human history, there have been thousands of gods and religions, but for the sake of argument, I'll primarily focus on the contemporary gods of Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, etc. I'd just like to add that you are also atheistic to all other gods but your own. The Bible, for example, is a terrible source of factual information. No sane and rational person can possibly believe that during sacrament, a wafer turns into the body of Christ and the wine turns into the blood of Christ. For rational Christians would say that it is merely symbolic, but there are Christians who honestly believe that it does. Which is disturbing because eating the body of Christ uh, is, well, you know, that's, ca that's cannibalism. But there are many other problems within the Christian Bible, such as impossible miracles and stories that make no sense whatsoever. Noah's Ark, for example, was, an 100, was 140 meters long and 24 meters wide. Now, imagine trying to fit 5,400 species of mammals on the boat, 10,000 species of reptile, 925,000 species of insect. It is safe to say that it would be incomprehensible to even try and imagine such a thing. Uh, what about the animals indigenous to Australia, the South Americas, Africa? I think you get it. You get the point. Um, what about flying to heaven on a winged horse like the Prophet Muhammad? I mean, people believe this really happened. Religion requires you to take up irrational beliefs without question. It requires you to disregard rational thinking. It, requ it requires blind, unquestioning faith in the absurd. How about this conundrum? You live your life in the best possible way. You're kind, charitable, and selfless. You, for all intents and purposes, live like the best Christian, but you don't believe in God. Now what happens when you die? You go to hell. On the other hand, you live a life of evil and malevolence, but repent on your death. Sorry about the birds in the background. The peacocks, I want to shoot them. You live a life of evil and malevolence, but repent on your deathbed, and you go to heaven. Oh, where is the justice in that? What about being born in, in the Middle East? Or being born in uh, an Australian Aboriginal? You didn't have a choice. 
Another core cool problem is that we know that Adam and Eve never, never existed, and there was no first homo sapien or human being. We can therefore conclude that the original sin of eating the tree of good and evil never happened. So original sin did not happen as the Bible states. Therefore, Jesus was a scapegoat killed by his father for the sins of two people that never existed. Evolution is a proven fact and denying its val val validity is an act of willful ignorance, which happens to be a big part of religion. Go figure. Also, why was it a sin to eat from the tree of knowledge? Why did God want people to remain ignorant? Also, if God is all-knowing, then we know that Adam and Eve would commit original sin. If he knew it, why did he give them the choice? Why, why did he give them the temptation? He created Adam and Eve in his image, a flawed, very human image, only to set up a trap that would condemn them for the rest of human existence and eternal afterlife, setting up the narrative that would have his son, that would have his beloved son nailed to a cross. Uh, stepping away from the Bible, um, what about the universe and the vastness of space? What about the some 100 billion galaxies containing billions of stars and even more planets? Why is the Earth located in such an obscure, unimpressive corner of the universe? You might say, well, why not? Or even better, how? The God of the gaps will inevitably be pushed back to before the expansion of the universe. If you want to claim that God's action was to set in motion the greatest, the great expansion of the universe, then fine. It do doesn't matter scientifically because the claim is unfalsifiable. It is also unprovable. The question of morals and ethics is a different matter entirely. The problem with religious ethics is that people are bound to them primarily through fear. The fear of God's wrath and his ultimate punishment of eternal suffering in hell. Do this, believe this, if not, you're going to burn in hell forever. Tell that to children, and they will try to follow the rules, uh, not because they make rational sense, but because the loving God will sentence you to eternal suffering of the worst kind for not believing blindly. At its core, religion is Platonic philosophy. Plat Platonism is bad philosophy. It gives rise to dictators, masters, slaves. Aristotelian philosophy, on the other hand, is based on objective reality and individualism. I say, uh, I say religion is platonic because of, you know, the realm of the higher forms. It, it, it requires you to believe in some place that doesn't exist. Aristotelian philosophy, like I said, on the other hand, is based on objective reality and individualism, i.e. One, uh, one can obtain a set of moral and ethical values through reason and evidence. Now is the time for rational ethics based on reality. We no longer need a flawed God. Philosophy can do better than the Ten Commandments. Don't keep slaves, for example, would have been a decent addition to the commandments, but the Christian God never bothered to express the idea that humans should not uh, be property. Perhaps the Eleven Commandments doesn't have a very good ring to it. Now, I do apologize for being so harsh, but it is uh, perhaps the best way for me to make a case for atheism. I'm being facetious and provocative in hopes that it will make you question that which you are not allowed to question. Cracks in the lens through which we view the world is uncomfortable and even painful. But a rational view of the world opens up the greatest wonders. It allows us to appreciate just how lucky we are to spend this brief time in the sun. Yes, the idea of mortal death with nothing beyond is unnerving, but it also makes us realize that we must live our lives to the best of our ability because it is the only one we have. What will eternity be like after we die? Well, just like it was before you were born. I could go, I could go, go, I could go on and on. Uh, perhaps I will at some point. I'll call this episode one. And if I'm, I'm sure you guys will want to rebut my positions and I will, you know, gladly answer and reply. Let me leave you with a beautiful yet provocative quote by theoretical physicist Lawrence Krauss. Every atom in your body came from a star that exploded. And the atoms in your left hand probably came from a different star than your right hand. It really is the most poetic thing I know about physics. You, you are all stardust. You couldn't be here if stars hadn't exploded because the elements, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, all the things that matter for evolution and for life weren't created at the beginning of time. 
They were created in the nuclear furnaces of stars. And the only way for them to get into your body is, is if those stars were kind enough to explode. So forget Jesus, the stars died so you could live. So you, so you could be here today. Lawrence Krauss. Interesting to think about. It's also provocative and facetious, I know. Um, guys, please comment, like, and subscribe. And uh, stay tuned for episode two. I'm sure they will be. And thank you for listening.